Hi everyone, welcome back to Premier Studying and Investing. I'm glad to have you. Today we're looking at Revive Therapeutics again. I say again because I looked over my last video. I do watch my own videos. I do do this mostly for my own personal investing and I like doing the research. It's just kind of something I like to do. So we can see right here, Revive Therapeutics. This is the one we're looking at today. You can see some of their competitors. $60 million market cap. If you saw the other video, you're going to know that there's really no analysts that are going to help us out. No one really covers this. So we're pretty much on our own. Okay, so we see this reprinted all the time, um, but I thought it'd just be nice to give it to you straight from the source. Basically, current antiviral intervention, interventions for the flu have exhibited modest effect, especially in improving mortality at at-risk populations such as the elderly. But they say novel antivirals have been plagued by poor oral bioavailability and lack of efficacy when not delivered early. This is because these drugs mostly act to prevent early process of the virus binding to cells or viral replication. But they go on to say that feels particularly the, I'm just going to call it the NAC, and we'll see this a lot with different studies that they're going to refer to when they talk about their drug thesis or why this has a good potential of helping respiratory diseases. They're going to say that the NAC with antioxidant and reducing activity have been investigated as effective therapies that abrogate the potential for influenza to cause severe disease. And so we see that often the severe respiratory distress disorder. So, uh, you know, they're trying to protect people from having significant long-term lung damage to the cells. So they say restoration of glutathione, the major intercellular thio antioxidant, is a critical functional activity of NAC. They also go on to talk about reactive oxygen species, ROS, and we'll see that later. But basically kind of what the idea is, uh, a lot of times we're going to see busilamine is uh, looked at uh, the benefits as far as if people have heart attacks. So when you have heart attack, I mean, basically there's a clot, a blood clot like we know, and the blood doesn't get to certain parts of the muscle in the, in the heart. And so, you know, those things either through lack of nutrition nutrients or oxygen, they receive some damage. There's another part that we're going to look at where when those things become re-oxygenated, there's also other damage. It's kind of if you've seen people that maybe climbing, mountaineering type stuff where if people get frostbite, they don't want you to thaw that out, right? Because more damage it happens when the blood comes back in, when it thaws, when it, so that's one of the things that they're looking at. Anyway, they say that that happens during influenza infections, that there's an aggregate destruction, inflammation, and projected death of epithelial epithelial cells. This is like a covering over a lot of cells of most like organ tissue. And so we hear that a lot, epithelial cells. Studies in human cells and animal models have shown that NAC works to prevent acute lung injury caused by influenza virus infection through inhibition of these ROS mediated mechanisms. So again, ROS is the reactive oxygen species. Okay. So I know, you know, we're not all medical experts, but let's just try to get through this. NAC has been investigated clinically and found to significantly attenuate clinical symptoms associated with influenza infection, especially in er, uh, elderly at-risk patients. While NAC is taken up by the cells and has low toxicity, clinical efficacy has required long-term and high-dose administration because of the modest relative potency limiting its clinical uh, applicability. So they're going to go on, they're going to say, okay, so bucilamine, what does this have to offer? It says, well, it has one well-known safety profile, which we talked about in the last video. It's been prescribed as a treatment for rheumatoid arthritis in Japan and South Korea for over 30 years. It has, uh, it's a cysteine derivative with two thiol groups that is 16 times more potent than NAC uh, as a thiol donor in in vivo. So in the body, that's in vivo means in the body or in like a living uh, organism as opposed to like in vitro, like in a petri dish in a lab. So giving it a vastly superior function in restoring the gluteothone and therefore greater potential to prevent acute lung injury during influenza infection. So now you can start to kind of see, okay, this has a lot of overlap. If, if Okay, if it is a COVID play, okay, it makes it more reasonable why that makes sense. If not, they're gonna have to pitch us on this is gonna be a great thing to help people dealing with the flu, with the seasonal flu, and I'm not, I'm not convinced yet, okay? You gotta forgive me. Uh, if you're invested in this, I'm not saying you made a bad investment. The point of looking at stocks is to be critical, right? And to decide this is our money. There's a lot of options out there. Do we really believe that this is better than the other 2,000 options that we have before us? And we can't know all of them, but we should at least be able to say no to some of them if they don't look like they have decent opportunity in the short term. And I'm saying, I don't see a lot of opportunity in this stock besides the COVID play in the next 12 months. Moving on, mucilamine has also been shown to prevent uh, Oxidative and uh, reperfusion, so injury, this is profuse, right? This means there's a lot of something. Well, reperfusion means like it's coming back. This is the idea of the blood coming back to an injured area and it gets re injured or injured more as the blood comes back into this area in the heart and in the liver tissue. It's, um, it's highly permeable for effective delivery into cells. So it helps prevent some of that reperfusion injury. Bucilamine has unrealized potential for treatment of influenza with both proven safety and proven mechanism of action similar to MAC. 
but with much higher potency like we saw 16 times, uh, mitigating the previous obstacles to using uh, thiols therapeutically. It's also reasonable to hypothesize that similar processes related to RS are involved in acute lung injury during the Rona infection, possibly justifying the investigation of busilamine as an intervention for the Rona. So we are also going to look at the things that we're going to look at in this video besides this, which I think is a good start, is we're going to look at, they say, here's our scientific rationale, our drug rationale. I'm going to look at these articles and that's going to take a little bit. If you want to skip through that, that's fine. But you can see some of the headlines are related to influenza, swine flu, antiviral resistance, the effectiveness of, uh, this is for H1N1. So they're going to talk about these types of things and we can see here again NAC. We're just going to read the abstracts um, and I, I did read this, uh, this thing at Horowitz out of Denver. Um, but anyways, the other thing I'm going to look at quickly before I do that, let's jump over. We'll look at the market size because for the, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll finish what I'm saying. Finish the looking at the market size for the gout because people are like, oh, well, it's, a, it's you know, we have this gout play. And so you see that here, revive clinical history would be still mean. Uh, orphan drug status, we're going to look at that. And then the acute gout flares and this other disease called cisternia. So let me look at those real quick. We'll get those out of the way. And then what we'll do is just focus the rest of the video on one, what are these articles that they've linked here and left for us? What do they really have to say? How convincing are they? And two, the thing is, they're trying to repurpose busilamine. We've known that it's been around for 30 years. They just said so. So what does it take? What are the pros and cons of repurposing? And what does that require and entail? Because that's another aspect of, of looking at this. So from where I'm moving on from here is basically, like I said before, that basically phase one, no. Preclinical, no way. Filing IND, no way is any of this going to be ready for the next 12 months. So I'm still pretty much thinking this is all on busilamine shoulders, the near-term success, and I'm really, really, really gonna look to see is this anything but a COVID play, which was my initial knee-jerk reaction. The reason I really got into that is because you can see from this investor report from biospace.com, it says the company is also exploring the use of busilamine for potential treatment of infectious diseases. And I was like, when people were posting this stuff about depressive disorder, I was like, that's not an infectious disease. I was like, anxiety is not an infectious disease. So cystinuria, is one of the things that we just saw that they're planning on treating. Affected population is one in 7,000 to one in 10,000. I'm gonna multiply that by the population in the United States. It's about 33,000 people that they're talking about. 33 to 40,000 people, somewhere in that order. So not a huge, I mean, not a huge population at all. Very much would relate uh, into that orphan drug status. What about gout? I found two different things about gout. This is coming from uh, marketresearchfuture.com. They say the kegger, this is the compounded annual growth rate, is 8.4%. And you can see the breakdown, 45% of people have it in America, maybe 30% in Europe, and then the rest between Asia and the Middle East. They say Asia Pacific is expected to have the fastest growing market due to the increased prevalence of chronic gout, and China is the fastest growing region owing to its increased older population. I'm not going to get into the rest of this. Gout therapeutics market worth about $8.3 billion by 2025, and this from Grandview Search, or Grandview Research, excuse me, puts a kegger 16.1%. So that's at least interesting. Um, 2015 AstraZeneca had a product for it, Novartis received something in 2013. So let's go through these nine different articles really quickly, just read the abstracts and see kind of what they say, if it's much help at all. First one, it says NAC inhibit mucin synthesis and pro-inflammatory mediators in the alveolar type two, epithelial cells infected with influenza virus A and B with respiratory syncytial virus. Okay, so these are a lot of things we see. The type two cells, epithelial damage, all types of things we've heard about with the Rona. 64% of COPD exacerbations are caused by respiratory infections, including influenza strains A and B and respiratory uh, virus. They affect airway epithelial, increase inflammatory and apoptosis events through mechanisms involving ROS. We saw that, ROS. And induce the release of mucins and from epithelial cells that are involved in the deterioration of the patient's health during the course of the disease. The antioxidant NAC has proved useful in the management of COPD, reducing symptoms, exacerbations, and accelerated lung function decline. It's been shown in to inhibit influenza 
virus replication and to diminish the release of inflammatory and apoptotic mediators during virus infection. The main objective of the study is to analyze the effects of NIC in modulating the MUC5AC overexpression and release in an in vitro infection model of alveolar type 2 A549 cells infected with influenza strains A and B and RSV. We've also analyzed virus replication and different pro-inflammatory responses. Our results indicate a significant induction of a lot of these, these, we see these with the different cytokines, the different responses from the body, the IL-6, the TNF-alpha that is strongly inhibited by the NAC at the expression and at the release levels. It also decreased the intracellular H2O2 concentration and restored the intracellular total thiol contents. Mechanisms of NAC include inhibition of the NF-KB translocation and phosphorylation of MAPK P38. NAC also inhibited replication of, th th of the three viruses under study. This work supports the use of antioxidants in order to ameliorate the inflammatory effects of different viral infections during COPD exacerbation. So you can see, okay, I like this. I mean, this this seems to say it's pretty straightforward. Okay, NAC is helpful. It seems to have something to do with the intracellular total thiol contents. And I mean, we already know that eusilamine is 16 times more potent than NAC by itself. So pretty interesting. Next one. Attenuation of influenza-like symptomatology and improvement of cell mediated immunity with long-term NAC treatment. Okay. I'm I'm just going to skip to this last part. Administration of NAC during the winter thus appears to provide significant attenuation of influenza and influenza-like episodes, especially in elderly high-risk individuals. The NAC did not prevent H1N1 virus influenza infection, but significantly reduced the incident of clinically apparent disease. The next one, protective effect of NAC in a model of influenza infection in mice. Reactive oxygen intermediates ROI, and cytokines, particularly tumor necrosis factor, have been implicated in the pathogenesis of influenza. Using murine model of influenza, we have studied the levels of TNF, interleukin-6, IL-6, and superoxide generating, I don't know, oxidase, XO. Mice infected intranasally with influenza virus, APR-8, had high levels of XO, TNF, and IL-6 in the bronchiovascular lavage. As early as day three after infection, XO was elevated also in serum and lung tissue. Administration of the NAC significantly decreased the mortality in infected mice, indicating a role for R01 in the lethally associated with influenza, in the lethality, sorry, associated with influenza infection. NAC protects against H9N2 swine influenza virus induced acute lung injury. It says NAC has been shown to inhibit replication of seasonal human influenza A viruses. Here the effect of NAC on H9N2 swine influenza virus induced acute lung injury were significant, uh, were investigated in mice. The results showed that the pulmonary inflammation, pulmonary edema, this is like when the lungs fill with fluid, MOP activity, total cells, uh, neutrophilus, macrophages, TNF-alpha, IL-6, IL-1 beta, and CXCL10 in BAFL were attenuated by NAC. Moreover, our data shows that NAC is significantly inhibited uh, in the levels of TLR4 protein. Final comment is these results suggest antioxidants like NA6 represent a potential additional treatment option that could be considered in the case of an influenza A virus pandemic. This next one, influenza viruses, antiviral therapy, and resistance. Basically ends by saying this manuscript summar summarizes the occurrence and spread of antiviral resistant influenza viruses and highlights the importance for developing and or approving new antiviral compounds. So it doesn't talk much more specifically about what we're looking for. Look at all the people that worked on this thing. Effectiveness of neuraminidase inhibitors in reducing mortality in patients admitted to hospital with influenza A, H1N1, PDM09, virus infection, a meta-analysis of individual participant data. So they said basically during the H1N1 outbreak in 09 and 2010, 
there was a large use of neuraminidase inhibitors. One of the findings was what one of the findings was that compared to no treatment, neuraminidase inhibitor treatment, irrespective of time, was associated with a reduction in mortality risk. This article by Horowitz, actually on busilamine, is mostly talking about cardiac surgery or myocardial infarcation. It's uh, like the technical term for having a heart attack. Again, we see busilamine is 16 times more potent than NAC. So historically, mucilamine has been given orally for rheumatoid arthritis. There was a phase one study done, not by Revive, that they could give mucilamine doses at 25 milligrams per hour through IV for three hours. They elicited no serious toxicity. One of their findings was is that they could give this to people intravenously three hours, 25, or let's see. Had gross at doses greater than 10 milligrams per hour per kilogram. They found that it could be therapeutically effective for organ transplant, for heart attacks, or other acute inflammatory syndromes. Now, one of the big problems, and I would say this is a huge problem, is the delivery. We need to find out is it going to be given orally or is it going to be given through the IV? Because I think that makes a huge, huge, huge difference. Check out on my channel, I do a uh, $74 price target on remdesivir from Gilead Sciences and the big constraint with that is being able to get it out. If you have to give it to patients through an IV in a hospital setting, it's not going to make a lot of money. If they can turn that into some inhaled version, nebulized version, people can take it at home, people can take it outside of a hospital setting, then it's a huge, huge, huge deal. I would say the same applies to this. So again, we see from Globe Newswire, they're talking about the thousand patients that are going to be enrolled in the randomized one-to-one -one receive bucilamine either at uh, 100 milligrams a day or 200 milligrams for up to 14 days. This is for the Rona. And let's see where that is in that trial. So going over to clinicaltrials.gov, we can see the COVID-19 bucilamine phase three trial. I just want to look really quickly at the estimated completion date. It's May 1st of 2021. So if you feel like you're running out of time for the COVID play, I would say pick your spots. I mean, you don't have to jump right in today. There's going to be lows. There's no reason that I see that you need to get in on this right now. So I think there's going to be some good news hopefully come out when they hit like, I think it's like 80 or 100, something right around there. They're going to take a look at the safety study and have their safety board look at it. Um, so that's something to look for. But I mean, if the study's not going to be complete until May 1st of 2021, there's plenty of time to get in on this thing. No rush. One other thing, the bucilamine phase two trial in patients with cystin hernia. It doesn't look too promising. It says uh, the last time they updated this was May of 2017. It's first posted in 2016 by Revive. Recruitment status is unknown. So I'm not sure what is the slowdown on this, but um, I, d I wouldn't assume that this is an outdated link. So last thing we'll look at is what does it take to take a drug and repurpose it or use it for something new? This article says from PharmaOutsourcing.com, it's estimated that 30% of FDA approved new drug products are and repurposed drugs account for approximately 25% of pharmaceutical industry revenues, which is actually very encouraging. The global market for drug repurposing is estimated to reach 31.3 billion in 2020, growing at a compound annual growth rate of 5.1% from 24.4 billion in 2015, according to the BCC research. Just a little good news for you. This is a bit old, but I like this presentation. It's gonna give us the basic regulatory pathway for repurposed drugs. So repurposing can also be called repositioning, reprofiling, retasking, or therapeutic switching. There's many drugs that have done this before. Usually you have to file a 505B2 application. One of the really great things about it is that it permits the sponsor of a drug to rely on published studies under FDA safety and effectiveness findings from studies contained in other NDAs to satisfy the full reports requirement of the FDA, FDC Act. So, I mean, basically you don't have to run all these trials. You can say, hey, look, you know, safety, we already did it this way. It, you know, it already looks good. However, there needs to be a scientific or medical bridge. This is, you know, it used to be a rheumatoid arthritis drug and, and now it's going to be for lung infections. Well, you need to be able to show, you know, that we're making the switch, formulation, dosing regimen, active ingredients. These are some of the types of changes to approve drugs for the 505B2 application. Uh, Indication if you're switching from prescription to over the counter, 
uh, new device and combination product. So not really sure about all these, and of course you guys don't know either, but I just thought it'd be interesting, especially this part. It may be granted for three years of a new clinical investigation exclusivity. So three years, five years for a new chemical entity exclusivity, seven years of orphan drug exclusivity, six months pediatric exclusivity add-on, which is you know extra, this other one's a five-year add-on. So, you know, you have to think a little bit like, how long are they going to be able to have exclusive, you know, protection from generic versions of this coming in and being used by other companies? If you get the orphan drug exclusivity, that's seven years of marketing exclusivity. The FDA, FTC Act provides a seven-year period of ex exclusive marketing to the first sponsor who obtains marketing approval for a designated orphan drug. The scope of orphan drug exclusivity is broad. It prevents FDA approvals and ANDAs full for the 505B1 NDAs, the 505B2 applications. Orphan drug exclusivity begins on the date that a marketing application is first approved for the designed orphan drug. So to end, I'm going to go back to my original starting point, which is looking at this chart and saying, what do we see here? All I can really tell you is that the COVID phase three estimated completion date is May 1st, 2021. I think it gives you a lot of time, especially if you're very bearish in the market in general. I know it's a penny stock, so we're not seeing huge fluctuations, but maybe you don't want to get in at 19 cents or 18 cents. Maybe you think you can get in at 10 cents. I mean, who knows, right? But you have plenty of time because the rest of this stuff is not going to be breaking through into revenue or marketing or full-blown approval anytime soon. I hope that helps you guys. Let me know if you disagree, you know. I mean, it's not, am I right or am I wrong? Who cares? The idea is, how can we be smart together? If you have better information, drop a link, you know. If you say, no, you're wrong, let us know, you know, because, I mean, this is investing money. And one cool thing about being retailers but working together is, like, there's an army of us, you know. We may not have... Um, you know, these high paid positions. We may not have the best office in New York City, but there's literally thousands of us. Well, there's maybe only, you know, a couple people working on, uh, you know, looking at these, analyzing these drugs, maybe 30, 30 analysts with, you know, full blown great academic credentials, but there's 30 of them, you know, they're probably not gonna miss much, but, um, you know, we can, we can catch a lot. Like I said, no one's looking at this. No one's looking. There's no analyst with eyes on this thing. So it's just on us and we know what we think value there is and opportunity there is. So, uh, hope that helps. Thanks.